Hey, Dr. Murphy. How are you doing, Deb? Good. How are you? Doing well. Excited to be here. Yeah, me too. Okay, thanks. Uh, I see a couple people are trickling in. We're going to wait. We opened up a little early. Wait, we'll start right at uh, the top, assuming Lynn joins us. Uh, we're going to be... The, the topic for this particular X spaces or Twitter spaces is uh, we're featuring Lynn Alden, who was a guest on the InFi podcast last Friday. So for those who are tuning in here, let me just go ahead and explain. So, of course, I'm Robert Murphy. I think you know me if you're joining via my invitation or posting. Uh, I'm the chief economist at Infinio. The website there is infinio.ai. Uh we are this week, the topic is going to be focusing on Lynn Alden and her book, Broken Money, but I'm sure we'll be able to add in, you know, some more current event things, particularly what happened in Argentina. That's probably something I'll ask her right on, off the bat. Okay, here she is. Great. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. We'll officially start at this point. Uh, our special guest is Lynn Alden. Our uh, other guest, who is he's pretty special too, is lawyered dot e t h uh at bit grateful and he, he's our in-house counsel here at infidio and knows all sorts of things about uh blockchain and, and digital finance so lynn thank you for joining us um if you could maybe just open up and uh i think the the first question so maybe just explain a little bit about what your book is but i think the first question people would want to know is what's your reaction uh to what happened in argentina and i should mention Folks, I, I would like to, you know, we want to work in your questions. So the, the bottom right, uh, if you click that button, I think it's, it might be purple on your end uh, and do questions and, and people will be feeding me questions. So you will, we're not going to hand mics to people, but we will try to work at as many of your questions for Lynn as possible. So uh, Lynn, do you want to uh, take the floor for a few moments and just explain you know, what you do in your book and then maybe your thoughts on Argentina? Sure. Yes. Thank you for having me and thank you for everyone for coming. Um, so my book, Broken Money, uh, talks about the past, present, and future of money. Uh, and unlike a lot of um, money history books, it does it, it, it uses the lens of technology to, to look at money. So instead of dwelling on political decisions that were made, uh, like you know, it covers that when they happen, but it mainly always just keeps reframing back to the question or the analysis of what types of technologies came that shifted how people either what, what they use as money or how they interact with money, how they think about money, um, and, and, you know, for better or worse in some cases, how, just how that evolves over time. And then towards the end, like, you know, the the the, the last, uh, you know, several chapters of the book focus on the, the most recent things that are happening that we don't fully know how they're going to shake out yet. So Bitcoin, stable coins, other things like that, basically like, you know, where, where this is all potentially headed and some of the kind of the implications of, of certain things. Um, as for Argentina, um, I'm not an expert on Argentinian politics, um, but I have, of course, followed this election because it's um, it, it's very novel. Um, I think basically it's it's a clear instance where if something gets very extreme. Um, people are going to eventually swing hard to the other side. So um, he's certainly a character. I don't know how much of his uh, kind of antics are, are character driven or if, I, I don't really know. But he's it's definitely like the an, an interesting kind of history point because as far as I know, there's no other head of state that would class that, that would classify himself as an anarcho capitalist um, or an Austrian economist. So um, we'll see how that shakes out. I I also don't fully get um, how many how much power he has in their um, parliamentary body. Like I don't know how I don't know how um, I haven't followed it closely enough to know the probability of him getting his actual um, kind of plans through. Um, but it certainly changes things. It's certainly an area that I'm going to be watching pretty closely in the, in the months and years ahead. Okay, thanks. Let me just chime in here for a second then, um, Lawyer. If you have thoughts too, uh, I'll turn it over to you in a minute. Um, but just to, to follow up on what Lynn said there, it's uh, so my understanding is that strictly speaking, what um, Malay is going to do it's not so like, in other words, there's some countries where they basically, quote, force people to use U.S. dollars. Like they, they like they have their own domestic currency and they just set up what's maybe called a currency board or they have just an official peg where they go buy a bunch of U.S. treasuries and then they just pledge like, oh, we'll redeem our dollar or sorry, our currency for U.S. dollars at this particular rate and blah, blah, blah. And that's not 
what Malay's doing. He his plan is is basically to shut down the Argentina, you know, government and central bank and their role in issuing currency and just let the people of Argentina decide. But since right now, especially like in the black market, in practice, people are using U.S. dollars, you know, given how awful the inflation has been in Argentina, that de facto people are saying, oh, that's basically a dollarization. And specifically, it's Nicholas uh, Kachanowski, who's an Aust- like a professional Austrian economist. Um, he had a proposal that, you know, that people are saying that's the one that Millet saw and, and said, yes, that's what I'm going to try to. Now, again, as Lynn said, I don't know the politics and their government structure, like how much authority does, you know, can he just do this through executive order or does he have to get approval from people? You know, that I'm not as clear about. But the, my point being, his actual proposal is more just separate the state from money and let people do what they want. And he's I think he's calling it dollarization just so people don't panic and say, oh, my gosh, we won't have money if you become president. So I think that's partly what's going on. It's a bit of, you know, shrewd marketing on his part. Uh, lawyer, do you want to chime in at this point? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that I don't know about what this means in practice. And I think that's probably true about everybody. Um, I think it is worth noting that, you know, a lot of people are jumping on the, um, you know, he loves Bitcoin. And I think there might be one or two quotes out there saying that he does. But I, I don't think it's just that he says a lot of the same things that Bitcoiners say. But, you know, I, it seems like his interest is getting people on the dollar um, which I think, you know, could, is probably good advice for individuals. I'm not sure what it looks like at this point in their trajectory to sort of have everybody wanting to jump off into dollars there. I, it's, I'm sure that's something that people are thinking about now and I'd love to hear about it, but I, I don't know what that looks like. Okay, great. Um, again, folks, just to remind you, if you're tuning in, if you want to post a question, just, uh, you know, use that bottom right button and, and type it in and then it'll get fed to us and I'll, I'll work it into the discussion. So Lynn, and also too, I should probably, I kind of assumed everyone knows who Lynn is, but here's a, a description of her at Bitcoin Magazine. Lynn Alden is a prominent financial analyst and investment strategist known for her insightful research on various investment topics, including equities, macroeconomics, and particularly Bitcoin. She's the founder of Lynn Alden Investment Strategy, which provides both free and premium research for investors. Okay. So Lynn, can you, just returning to your book, Lynn and um, maybe give people the 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 way the well, why is why is our money broken? Why don't, why don't we start with something like that? You called it the title of the book, and so can you just uh, elaborate a little bit more? Because and again, folks, I interviewed Lynn. If you go to Infinio.ai, you'll see uh, the episode that's currently at the top of the queue there in the podcast section. But I really loved the opening of your book when you spelled. I mean, of course, I work in this area. I'm familiar with the fact that government issued monies are awful. But yet you really painted a picture of you know people in other countries literally having to rob banks to get their own money out and things like that. So can you just speak a bit to that, that, you know, why, what do you mean by saying our money is broken right now? Yeah, so basically, I think a lot of it has to do with the kind of century and a half long mismatch we've had between transaction speeds and settlement speeds. And so basically, ever since the dawn of the telecommunication age, which really came into into being in the second half of the 1800s, we've been in this global environment where people can send around money quickly through ledgers, through credit. Um, And that eventually got so abstracted compared to the underlying money, which at the time was gold, that they eventually were able to drop gold. And we're in this environment where there's 160 different currencies in the world, and most of them are free floating against others. Um, Other ones are pegged to the dollar, but of course, pegs can break. uh, and, And, you know, over enough years usually do. Um, and so as rough as we have money in some cases in developed markets, like, you know, we'll complain about 8% inflation or, you know, in the U S we have like a 7% annual money supply growth over a multi-decade period. Obviously it's been a little, um, higher than that recently, but that's the longer term average. Whereas when you look at developing countries, it's often 15%, 20%, 25%. Um, kind of a shocking number of them have had outright hyperinflations or triple digit inflation within living memory. So within the past like 40, 50 years. Um, and so people are kind of stuck in these silos. And it's obviously was not always like that. And a lot of it is just based on kind of the the local maximum we find ourselves in now, which is we have all these, you know, fast ways to send them around money. Um, and the, the slower, harder monies don't really keep up with it. Uh, and so 
governments, no matter how bad their money is, keep kind of in introducing new bad monies like the currency will fail and people will either fall back to the dollar or they'll go ahead and issue another like version of that money. And so people find themselves stuck in these kind of ever inflating silos um, and unable or at least more challenged to get their hands on, on good money, at least until some more recent technologies have made that easier. Okay, great. Thank you. Let me um, circle. We, so we do have a question from the audience. And again, a few folks, if you've just tuned in, Lynn Alden is our featured guest here. We're also joined, as we often are, by Lawyered. And uh, we're talking about her book, Broken Money. But we do have a question from the audience saying, if Javier Millet cuts down government a sizable amount and Argentina is fully using the U.S. dollar in roughly a year from now, will the positive economic effects be seen immediately? In a longer term horizon, could this lead to Argentina becoming one of the wealthiest countries? Okay, so I'll take a shot at that and see if either of our guests want to chime in as well. So in my view, I mean, the standard Austrian business cycle theory says how, what what happens, what causes the business cycle, that the banking system in modern times fueled by the central bank, they pump in, uh, you know, n new money into the credit markets that isn't backed by genuine saving, that floods the credit markets, it uh, allows businesses at artificially low interest rates to, to borrow and start long-term projects. And there's not enough real savings to bring all of those projects over the finish line. And that at some point, typically, the banking system gets nervous. The central banks, they see like price inflation running hot and they back off. And then, you know, the errors become manifest and there's a crash. So here, you know, that's just kind of that process on steroids. And so, yes, I, I do think it's true in general if the you know, Argentina's central bank had been pumping in all kinds of money and causing massive price inflation. If they slammed the brakes, you would expect there to be a big crash, which is actually in an Austrian view, a good thing that everybody's, you know, sort of reorienting the means of production into their more sustainable uses. But there is a temporary period. If, if in other words, if the economy is in an unsustainable trajectory in order to get workers to go to the right jobs, they have to get laid off from what they're doing originally. Right. So that that shows up as massive unemployment. That, but that's actually a cleansing thing, and it can be real quick if the you know, central government doesn't interfere and you know control prices and things. So uh, it, here it's a little bit different since they're like almost switching to a new currency. So I'm not you know I haven't really thought through the full implications of that element of this story. But yeah, in general, it wouldn't surprise me if there was a big crash. Just like if Ron Paul ended the Fed like he was campaigning on, I could imagine there would be a bad recession for you know se seven months or something but then there would be really solid, sustainable growth going forward. So that's the kind of thing here that, yeah, a lot of his proposals are radical and it might cause immediate pain and all the left-wing press is going to say, look what a disaster this is, these poor Argentinians. But I think it would pave the way for uh, more sustainable growth. Uh, Lynn, do you want to comment on that question? So I think you covered it well. Um, basically, as, as far as my knowledge of history is concerned, I think this would be the biggest country to quote-unquote dollarize. Um, and I, I use quotes like that because how you described before, it's not technically dollarization because it's basically just letting the market select its money. It's, you know, it's letting letting the market determine what money they want to use, which in the current time uh, tends to heavily be the dollar uh, in Argentina and most other countries that, that you know, encounter this. Um, and so it's, it'd be the largest, um, you know, roughly dollarized country if, if these policies enact. Um, like we mentioned before, I don't know the mechanisms in Argentina like you know can he do this or not with the political um infrastructure and support that he has like is it just something he can just do is it something that has to go through a vote of some sort I don't really know the um probability uh, of it happening because I'm just not really tied into Argentinian politics um should it happen I, I agree with you there probably would be a shock at first um in general there's been a a, a decent track record of countries um uh, dollarizing and then, and then stabilizing some of the problems they've had because when people think of inflation, they often think of uh, savings get eroded away, which of course is a big problem. Uh, but that's only a part of the problem uh, because there's other, uh, and I cover this in my book a lot, there's basically all economic activity gets so much more frictions added to it because the unit of account is unreliable, right? So every year you have to try to aggressively increase your wages, if you're a business that's managing like supply, like uh, you know your your expenses, like your your contracts, your various supplies versus you know what you're selling, 
you have, you, you have to constantly avoid mismatches. You can't do long-term contracts. You have to keep updating them quickly, which, you know, is just extra overhead. Um, it's very easy to kind of just run into problems like that. And so economic calculation and productivity is just way harder in these inflationary environments. And so having a more steady unit of account can improve things a lot. Obviously, it's going to be culturally dependent, like how, you know, how there's a lot of kind of infrastructure there. There's like, I think some, I read something like nearly half of the population there works for the government, right? So that could obviously be a very big transition um, for a period of time. So I, I do think that there could be a period of time where it's very challenging, but then if they do, in one way or another, have better money, that improves things. Now, they're still at that point relying on the dollar, and so they still get kind of economic shocks pushed their way from the U.S., right? So it's not, an, it's not actually a decentralized sound money. It just happens to be more sound than what they're working with now. Yeah, if I uh, just could respond to that too. It's, I agree with you, Lynn. So certainly, it should not come off. It, it was kind of ironic that a lot of we libertarians were jumping up and down like oh my gosh i can't believe you won uh when the, the announcement came in and then people were saying oh okay this is funny like a bunch of austral libertarians are excited about a guy who's gonna you know dollarize the economy like don't you guys want to end the fed yourself so <laughs> yes and that's why i was saying earlier that strictly speaking i don't think it's so much that his plan certainly nicholas kachinowski's proposal was not to say hey here at gunpoint we're going to force you all now to use the u.s dollar and you know, pass legal tender laws and things uh, enshrining the U.S. dollar now is is the money that the state is forcing you to use in Argentina. That's not really what it is. I, again, I think he's just uh, using that phrase or that term so that people don't, you know, they understand this is probably what would happen in practice. But strictly speaking, you're allowed to do whatever you want. Um, and so and I think if that is what it is, that it'll be a good example that it'll show, OK, it doesn't lead to an absolute collapse it's not that people are going to be bartering chickens next thursday if you know if, if all of a sudden their central bank shuts down they can switch to other currencies but then over time if it is a genuinely open environment with free entry as it were um and some people too were talking about that you know he's receptive to what's what's called free banking if you know what that is so like banks can issue notes or you know electronic deposits and things um with other assets just being the what's on store and you know merchants could start using that so it would just allow for the proliferation of not just bitcoin but you know any other types of assets uh going forward so on that note uh lynn we have a question someone saying how will payment technology slash um point of sale system change the person said argentina but do you want to just you know you can broaden it too lynn you know i know you did a lot of this in, in, for, in your book just in general like however you want to, what caveats you want to give or what time frame you want to do, but just in general going forward, how do you see in terms of adoption by, you know, merchants and others of just allowing for people to buy things with different types of monies? Yeah. So basically what we, what we see in, like, if you look at El Salvador, for example, it's, it's a country where um, both the dollar and Bitcoin are money, but of course uh, in the present state, far more people use dollars uh, in most parts of the country. Um, that's probably what we would see in Argentina again, should this pass, should this, um, you know, start to happen pretty quickly, given, uh, you know, the, the political infrastructure there. Um, when we think about monetary technologies in general, like how can we expect things to change going forward compared to the way things have been done? Um, I think it's in some ways it's bigger than we think in some ways it's smaller. So, you know, for example, what's, what's kind of miraculous about bitcoin is that you can send someone value long distance quickly without relying on credit right so any any other mechanism like if i if i send him and here a payment using any of our ex other modes of of payment technology i'm basically just using my bank as a signaling mechanism when we're doing a chain of credit that eventually gets to you and then behind the scenes at some later time usually our our banks and our you know, these chain of counterparties will settle and batch things together. Um, and so all, all these long term, all these long distance fast payments are relying on credit. And what's interesting about Bitcoin is that you have this decentralized network uh, where you can send effectively a bearer asset to someone, um, a digital bearer asset, a, a scarce kind of piece of value. And it can go over the network and land in someone's wallet um, in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, depending on how many confirmations on average you want to wait for. Um, depending on the size of the payment. And so it's not reliant on credit. It's only reliant on the overall network 
continuing to function and continuing to be reasonably decentralized. Um, so there's still an ongoing, you know, there's never full settlement assurances technically, but basically, a, you know, for all intents and purposes, after no, a number of blocks, that transaction is final. Um, now, in practice, I, I think a lot of people would still be using whatever payment technologies they have now, right? So, for example, if someone uses Cash App, Cash App is now tied into the Bitcoin and Lightning Network. But when someone in a Cash App, uh, you know, sends money to someone else using Cash App, that's just on Cash App's internal ledger. That's basically just a, a custodial scaling layer on top of it. Um, and of course, they are they're tied into both dollars and Bitcoin. Um, and so I think a lot of the payment technologies will actually be kind of slow to change. And these become more relevant where those payment technologies are not working. So for example, I was talking to a videographer in Egypt the other month, and he was explaining how he does a lot of work for foreign clients and he charges in dollars. But by the time it hits his bank account, it's in Egyptian pounds. Um, and so what's neat about these current technologies you know, if I hire a videographer or a graphic designer or someone in, you know, any internet connected country, um, you know, she can send me a invoice and I can send her a payment in whatever she wants. Uh, it can be Bitcoin. It can be stable coins. It can go to her rather than go through her local firewall banking system and just get to her. So there are instances like that, especially in the global sense where payments can change. Um, I also think we're seeing some interesting stuff with Lightning and AI, which is, you know, very buzzwordy lately. But basically, the what's novel there is that you can have very fast micro payments. Um, so we kind of the, the modern payment infrastructure is kind of shockingly bad at micro payments, especially outside of some sort of like walled garden. Like if you have any sort of international micro payments, like if I want to send twenty cents to someone in another country. It's not really viable in, in most ways. Um, and of course, there are not many places where I'd want to do that. But for example, machines that are uh, using, you know, they're, they're paying for APIs in real time or they're paying for processing power in real time. Um, there's many instances where they might want to do micropayments. And so there are kind of new technologies like Bitcoin, Lightning, that kind of thing that makes that more viable. So I think we're both going to see a continuing trend of a lot of the current payment systems we're familiar with. But at the same time, these other things allow for other kind of commercial options that were not even, you know, that, that are kind of just entirely new. Okay, just to clarify on that last point there, you weren't saying that AI systems will help the Lightning Network become more efficient. You were saying the Lightning Network or things like it will allow, because right now with AI, like the, 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 the payment model is you pay for like a, the use of a specific query? Is, is that what you were saying? Yeah, I was, I was not referring to AI improving the Lightning Network. I was, I was referring to AI agents using the Lightning Network um, or similar things to make payments to other systems or to each other. Um, this is already kind of be, seeing some testing. Now, ironically, to your first point, there actually is a company that uses AI to help uh, lightning routing. So you actually can apply AI to make lightning more efficient, but that's not what I was referring to. I was referring to basically that with some of these technologies, we have more micropayment options now, which for humans are sometimes relevant. Like maybe I want to pay 25 cents to read an article rather than get, you know, subscription blocked all the time. Then have to like, you know, pull out a clunky payment method and sort that out or, you know, sign up for a subscription that I don't want just because I want to run one article. So there's kind of micropayment options like that, but then there's also various machine-to-machine -machine, uh, micropayments that can, I think can become more relevant in the future. And kind of for the first time, they're also now possible internationally. So, you know, I, I tested out this this app where it had ChatGBT in it, and you could pay over Lightning like the equivalent of a penny to ask ChatGBT a question, and you could be in, in practically any country and, and doing that, right? So you don't need like a subscription, you're just tapping through someone else's API um, and you're able to do it on a question by question basis, even internationally. Okay. Yeah, great. That's why I wanted to clarify, uh, make sure I got your point there. L let me put you on this spot. And I know this is just all hypothetical and we're not going to hold you to it, but just to get a sense of what, what you're, where you're coming from, can you give an idea like for the people alive listening to this call right now, do you think in our lifetimes, there'll be a point at which um, the majority of our transactions, you know, either, 
per transaction basis or per, you know, the the economic value of the flow of um, money transmitted, however you want to quantify it. But the majority will be on not using the what we now think of as a traditional payment system, like a, a currency issued by our nation, states, government, or central bank and going through traditional banks, but rather, you know, whether it's Bitcoin or some other thing that's on the blockchain or what have you, do you have a, do you have a sense of that? Like, do you think you're going to see that in your lifetime where most of your transactions are not done this the way it is right now? So I think that probably a lot of what we interface now will look somewhat similar. Like I mentioned before, the example of something like Cash App. Um, like, I think that so, there will still be a lot that looks familiar to today. Um, as far as the underlying, what, what's happening under the surface, what's the underlying settlement doing? Um, I do think that unless someone figures out a, how to like hack or stop or centralize Bitcoin, uh, I think it's on a path to keep growing over the next several decades. Um, and after, you know, 30, 40 years of existence at that point, uh, I think it probably would be big enough to, to start rivaling, um, you know, the major currencies. Um, so I, I do think that that's a realistic possibility. Um, of course, you have to monitor for for risks or, you know, the, the overall trajectory that it, that's happening or, uh, you know, obstacles that might slow that down. But yeah, my default case would be to see that that network continue to take a larger and larger market share until it's more more macro relevant on, you know, a big scale than it is today, where it's still, uh, even though it's increasingly relevant, it's still rather niche. Um, I also think that the overall kind of, like, if you look at global remittances, uh, according to the World Bank, it's like over six percent on average to send a remittance um, because it just the, the the existing banking infrastructure is not very good at that. And it's it actually if you send it with banks directly, it's usually more like eleven to twelve percent on average. Um, various kind of fintech overlays can reduce that on average to you know six percent. Some cases a little bit lower. It obviously depends on how much you're sending. Um, and so if someone's sending two hundred dollars, like a typical remittance size. They're often paying on average six percent fees, and I think that's going to likely be driven down in the in the years and decades ahead. Um, and then even for domestic payments, I, I think that if you look at kind of credit cards or you know payment systems like that, there's often it depends on the on the network, but there's often like a three percent charge on the merchant side uh, that we as the retail side don't really see. Um, and I think that that long term is also pretty untenable. So I think that. A lot of these percentages are going to be driven down, um, but that otherwise, um, you know, we already have for the most part decent domestic payment systems, uh, and I think that they can all just kind of tap together into share systems. I mean, one analogy that I would use is that when we use email, uh, like if I use Gmail and you use Yahoo, and you know, we want to send emails back and forth, we can, even though we're using different clients because they're tapping into the same open source protocols under the hood so it's like not every um like webmail client has to make sure that it works with every other webmail client instead they just have to make sure they work with the open source protocols and then they can send value around and so i think we can see in the future where you have underlying open source you know settlement like bitcoin and you can have layers on top of it like cash app and instead of you know cash app and paypal being entirely different siloed ecosystems if they're both tapped into Bitcoin Lightning or whatever else uh, is happening at that time, you could, you know, potentially transmit value between these silos, including globally. And I think that's um that'd be a much that'd be a welcome change compared to today. Okay, thanks. Um, again, for people who have, who are trickling in here, if you have a question uh, for Lynn Alden or for me or for lawyers for that matter, go ahead and on the bottom right just click that and type it in, and our people will funnel to me. Um, I understand, lawyer. Do you, do you have a question you want to ask? Yeah. Um, so, Lynn, I, I realize this is pretty high level, but outside of all the technical, like what this looks like in terms of, you know, a hard or soft switch to different money, what does it look like when in your gut? What is your gut sense of when a leader like this stands up and says, you know, let's use good money, whatever that is today. Let's get out there and work. Let's stop wasting money. Does that can that have a pretty real effect on the economy of Argentina going forward? Um, just in terms of their rent. Like to me, it seems like he's cheerleading um, in a way that resonates with people who understand the problem with money. Even though he's saying, let's let's use dollars, like that probably is the best money we have now. And it, it seems to resonate with a lot of the people in that, in that you know, the Bitcoin community. 
um, and uh, the Austrian community. What are your what are your thoughts on what that means in real terms in the economy going forward? Yeah, so one of the documentaries I watched recently was from Peter McCormack. Uh, he went to Argentina and filmed a documentary there on, on the situation a number of months ago um, in light of these upcoming elections. Um, and uh, one of the kind of the takeaways I got from the documentary was almost like the sense of this hopelessness or inevitability, at least financially. So, for example, one thing he pointed out was that, of course, people were people, you know, he expected to see more economic despair. But in many cases, he, he found very happy people. He found, um, you know, crowded restaurants, people playing sports, just basically just living their life. But whenever he talked to them about, you know, how, how does this business work or how do you do this? Um, they would all talk about just corruption as a matter of course. And the, a common phrase is like, well, it's Argentina. So, you know, and like that, that kind of, there's like that pessimism about the economic side or the um, monetary side, or just because of the sheer severity and the length of this problem being present. And so anything that could potentially turn that around, both give both the practical sense of people have better monies to, to more easily work with. Like there's fewer restrictions on using or getting other monies. Um, that can give them a, a practical bread, bread, uh, bedrock to start building from, but then also it could give psychological benefits, like better hope for the future economically, rather than kind of that mindset of, you know, it's happening again and again and again. There's no, there's no change on the horizon. So I, I do think that there are those intangible benefits. Um, I watch a little bit. Uh, so I, I'm like I said, I'm less familiar with Argentina, um, but for example, I go to Egypt every year, and so I talk to people there about the money situation. And while it's not as severe as Argentina, um, there's this similar sense of, you know, that things are not really getting better uh, necessarily. And then that the whole money system is just continuing to be an issue. And so whenever you get a harder pivot towards something, you know, in addition to those practical benefits, you can get those psychological benefits of, you know, people just realizing that maybe, maybe the future can be better than now. And then, of course, that can enhance productivity. That can that can bring uh, economic vibrancy back. That can uh, reduce the brain drain that happens out of some of these countries and make people want to stay there where people want to go to them, rather than people always kind of trickling out if they can. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. It's, it could be very powerful. I mean, you see how it could work in a household, right? If people are just sort of stressed out that they're spending too much and not making enough, but you know they realize it all comes out in the wash, but maybe it doesn't and then things go bad it's like that's all that's happening on a whole nation national level right it's like well we're just printing the people are the people are corrupt and and this thing will just continue versus the mentality of well let's not waste money there because it affects our bottom line let's actually count count our dollars and use them um effectively let's go out and make money for ourselves I, it, it seems to me like it could change everything i agree yeah we'll see what happens um one of the negative cases is Egypt again, in the sense that they had their revolution, and then they they pivoted hard in one direction, and then that didn't work. And then they they basically are now in kind of the same situation they were in pre-revolution, more or less. And so now there's like this renewed sense of like detachment from the whole thing because it's like, well, we already tried that once, and and then so you kind of get you get locked in for a you know, longer multi-decade period of time. So there's there's that downside possibility that for whatever reason this this gets interrupted it get, it doesn't work it doesn't stick it doesn't it gets blocked it gets reversed at some point then people then go back to say well we even gave it our our most aggressive shot yet and it still didn't work right so that's that the the risk on the other side of this great they doubled down on their citizens well at least we can have some hope Okay, uh, we got some more questions flowing in here, and folks, we're going to end it at 45 after just to keep things tight um, and respect Lynn's time as well. So, again, if you're Trek Lynn and you got questions, put it in the lower right, just type it in, and we'll try to get to it. Um, so we got a question, and I'll, I'll take a quick shot at this, Lynn, to give you time to think in case you want to collect your thoughts. But the question is, what are your thoughts on the gold activity in Shanghai? So let me just chime in real quickly on that. Uh, not Shanghai in particular, but more broadly with China. So I did a piece for the American Conservative magazine on the fate of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. And one thing I, you know, one line of evidence that I explored was looking at the official gold reserves that, you know, the, the central banks report, I think to the IMF, or maybe the World Bank, um, the, the U.S. has claimed from 2000 through the present 
that they have about 8,000 tons of gold, which is by far the highest reporting. China um, quintupled their official reserves, you know, from 2000 to 2022, uh, reporting that they have now at some something like 2,000 and change tons. Uh, and the other BRICS, and not South Africa, but the BRIC, they all have large percentage increases in their gold holdings. And so, you know, if you were concerned that, oh, it looks like there's this coalition of co countries that are trying to insulate themselves from reliance on the dollar to maybe, you know, possibly down the road issue, a, you know, a competing thing maybe with, with backing by gold. You know, I'm not saying that's what they're doing, but they're moving in that direction. And also Dominic Frisbee, he makes the case, uh, re he recently was on the Tom Woods show, that he thinks China is vastly under-reporting their official gold holdings for various reasons. Like they don't want to rock the boat. They're just kind of quietly in the corner getting stronger and stronger. Um, and, and he gives reports like just looking at mining figures and activity in Shanghai exchanges and elsewhere saying, no, China's got to be sitting on way more gold than they're officially reporting. So that's my two cents. Uh, so, so, Lynn, do you have any thoughts on the gold activity in Shanghai, which is what the original question was? Yeah, so the original question might be referring to some of the price dislocations that have been happening in the market rather recently. Um, I know that uh, analyst Luke Groman has has commented on that. I, I followed that less closely than him. But basically, um, we've been seeing some larger than normal price differentials between uh, gold in, in Shanghai and, and gold in you know London or the U.S., um, and at least in, in the initial instance, uh, the price eventually closed upward. So it closed towards the price that was happening in China. Uh, and whether that's a, just how it worked out that time, or if that's a, a sign of kind of changing geographic center of where price discovery happens, I, I think remains to be seen. Um, so I think it's worth watching. I don't have a strong opinion on it because I haven't dived into that as deeply as, as, uh, you know, some other analysts like Luke Groban has. As far as the, the bigger topic of gold being more uh, interesting to central banks in general, that is a trend that's happening ever since the global financial crisis, and especially ever since a few years after that, there has been a change where the foreign sector, while they're not dumping their treasuries, they're just not accumulating treasuries as high percentages as they used to. And there has been an uptick in interest in gold. If you look at gold, official central bank holdings of gold, they were declining for a number of decades in terms of tonnage and literally right like 2009 you see like a v-shaped pivot um where they started reaccumulating tonnage um in aggregate obviously some countries more than others um but especially in in the kind of the BRICS type of nations um there's a pretty aggressive accumulation um and yeah as far as analysis goes um you know there's been over the past couple of decades a lot of analysis showing that most of the gold is basically going west to east um basically the direction of trade surpluses. Um, and so when you analyze with Swiss refiners or other things like that, you generally find that China has should have an enormous amount of gold there. Now, it, it, it's still a question of what percentage is owned by the government, right? So they, are they understating their number or is it just that so much of that is on the private balance sheet? It's, you know, I don't really have a firm opinion on that, but that's certainly something that analysts are paying attention to and that it wouldn't be shocking at all if China did have more than they are currently reporting just because of the sheer scale of their trade surpluses, um, the amount of internal mining that they do, uh, the amount of imports uh, of gold they've been having. And so that's certainly something I think is relevant longer term. Um, but it still kind of leads to the problem that, you know, even if China says we actually have this much gold, how do we, how do we know? Like just who's auditing it or um, how can we verify that, that they have that much? Right. So, Gold still has an inherent audibility problem, um, but I, I, we are kind of seeing that that shift where a lot of sovereign reserves either want to diversify or otherwise just kind of hedge their bets a little bit when it comes to just aggressively accumulating things like treasuries. Okay, great. That, yeah, and I'm glad you made the clarification. I it's hard to avoid falling into the collectivist trap, but right, like I. Strictly speaking, you shouldn't be saying, oh, and then China is going to do this. And then, you know, India is going to do this. And like, you know, there there's lots of people involved. Uh, but for what it's worth, the, uh, Lynn, the, the Dominic Frisbee calculation where he thought, you know, he was trying to say that the the government of China has way more gold than efficient. But he, he was accounting for the, you know, the, the state owned enterprises like he was cutting his numbers proportionally to, to really focus on just saying, no, the actual, uh, you know, the, the, the commies over there. Um, also I made him, I misspoke. Someone corrected me up behind the scenes. 
my article on the displacement of the U.S. dollar was Chronicles magazine, not the other one I said, and I won't say the other one just to avoid uh, double downing on the on the confusion. Okay, so uh, we got another question coming in. I remember my economic professor saying, "Have an economy based on hard money with limited size prevents the economy from growing because there's limited money to finance new opportunities. Fractional reserve banking creates money for the new enterprises. Our new industry is limited with hard money." So I'll take a quick shot and. Lynn and or lawyer, uh, if you guys want to chime in. So it, here, and I think, you know, this is particularly relevant for Bitcoin. And this is a thing that people wondered, like, well, gee, if it caps out at 21 million and, you know, people are occasionally losing, uh, you know, Satoshis, at least along the way, uh, you know, isn't that going to limit growth? And isn't that going to be, a, you know, be a huge credit crunch? It, in general, no, that it, it's true if you're in the middle of a, you know, expansionary boom, and then all of a sudden the central bank cuts the money supply in 30% or something, and people didn't see that coming, that could be very distortionary. But no, if everybody sees decades ahead of time what's going on with the money supply, like in the case of Bitcoin, if the, if the world all used Bitcoin, they would take that into account, prices would adjust. So you know, for a new business to expand and be profitable, it's just that it needs to have margins. It's not that you know, its absolute revenues need to be growing by a certain percent every year. That, that's not required at all. Um, Lynn, do you want to chime in on that question? Yeah, as long as the money is sufficiently divisible, um, there, there's no issue with with basically the the unit itself. I mean, but you, the money just gets more valuable per unit rather than having more of those monetary units available. Um, and a lot of this comes from like just people have recency bias, and so when they see these uh, recessions or depressions, um, they often blame kind of the the money itself. But that's that's in a very leveraged environment. Basically, if you have very inflationary monetary policy or monetary situation and then you have a lot of debt build up on top of that inflationary base um and then you try to harden or otherwise run into a gigantic credit event obviously that's very disruptive whereas if you have an environment where the money has been hard for a long period of time and is, is a consistent policy um then leverage is not going to build up to that degree to begin with. A lot of the leverage that builds up is because the unit of account is weakening or because um, there's just more and more kind of claims or abstraction or, or credit building on top of it. Uh, and so those events are very disruptive. But obviously, if, if you if you have, you know, decent money, it's like imagine if you if you price things in pennies instead of dollars, right? It, it wouldn't really affect things. What matters is what are pennies or dollars changing over time? What is the supply of them happening? And if the if the um, if the supply is not increasing uh, at all, or it's increasing very slowly, um, then basically it just means that our every unit of that money can buy you on average a little bit more than it could several years ago because you've gotten you know we've made more stuff, we've gotten more productive. Um, and so I, I I did I generally disagree with that economic view that you need like constantly increasing money supply to have commerce happen. Okay, great. I think we got time for just one more question here. Uh, so Lynn, how do you foresee self-custody of crypto assets being mainstream? I think most people are lazy and don't really want to self-custody their assets. So do you have a, a view on that? So I often see people say that most people can't do it, which I, which I disagree with. I mean, most people drive and like driving is a way harder thing to do than, than writing down, you know, 12 words and keeping them safe, uh, or using a, a standard hardware wallet. Um, so people certainly can self custody, uh, the percentage that I think will, will probably always remain rather small. That that's kind of my take. Um, if you look right now, um, you know, the numbers are at most a few million, um, of people that self custody, even though you know, over a hundred million people, um, you know, purportedly own it on exchanges and, and custodians and things like that. Um, and so I think that it's, it's a probably going to remain a fairly small percentage uh, of people that self custody even though I do think that for, especially for people that start to get larger amounts, um, I do think it would be good practice, uh, to self custody at least some of the money that they have so that they can have that more, that bare asset approach. And I also think in small amounts, people will have like wallets that they might use that have a little bit of, you know, money that they custody themselves. Um, but I think that will, it, it's the optionality that's important uh, in many cases. And it's the, whether or not the large pools of capital do it, I, I think will be relevant. Um, yeah, I think that that probably 
even in, in a number of years or decades, I think that the percentage of people that, that choose to do it will probably still be pretty small is my, my guess. Do you think it would ultimately be similar to the groups of people or the numbers of people who self custody U S dollars? I mean, it's the same on the in an institutional level, right? There's clearing houses and there's big institutions that hold dollars for small institutions. And there's just some people out there that put money under their mattress, but most people aren't holding on to their dollars in significant amounts, just like you said, like small wallets for petty cash. Well, it, it's interesting because that depends on the country. Like if I go to Egypt, there are more people that have like like cash dollars tucked away because, you know, they can't really put them in a bank. Uh, and if they did, they wouldn't really trust it. Um, and so you, you see a little bit more self-custody in places where they, they generally are less trustful, the custodians. Um, in, so that will be, remain true, right? Wouldn't that factor affect both scenarios? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, basically in places, I think basically when people are, are have a, either they trust the custodians or there's a good reason to, maybe they're heavily audited and, and proof of reserves and, you know, various ways to, to demonstrate to the market that this is a reliable entity. Uh, I think people will probably trust it in an environment where there's been like failed custodians or an environment that's just less reliable, probably a higher percentage will want to self custody. Um, and, and just that, that's just generally what we see so far is that, that so far there's not been a big priority towards self custody. Uh, when FTX blew up, there were, um, you could you look on chain and see that there was a surge of self custody activity, and some of the wallet makers reported uh, that they indeed indeed had kind of a surge of sales, um, but those tend to be rather short lived. Um, and I do think that it, it's not that people again, it's not that it's really hard, or it's not that people can't do it. Um, and I do think that you know there's just certain things that people will grow up with that are just more intuitive, like managing cryptographic keys uh, is something that. You know, sounds esoteric to people, but you know, a lot of people today, you know, will know how to do that, but not know how to write a check, right? It's just, it's just kind of a a, a monetary technology you grow up with that becomes more common over time. So I don't, I don't think it'll be that hard. I just think that probably a lot of people will have a decent amount of trust in custodians um, to hold it for them, uh, and that that you know, probably on an ongoing basis, a rather small percentage will want to self custody the any or the bulk of their money. Okay. Well, thanks guys. Uh, I think we need to wrap it up there and respect everybody's time. Um, so thanks for tuning in. Our guest this week has been Lynn Alden discussing her book, Broken Money. Just to remind you, if you go to infinio.ai and just click on the co- the podcast tab, you can see uh, I had a lengthy interview with Lynn about her book that dropped last Friday. You can see links to all of her materials and, and how to get her book there. Uh, please follow Lynn um, at at Lynn Alden Contact, and Lynn is L-Y-N. Uh, I'm at Bob Murphy Econ, and the Infinio uh, account is at Infinio Group. And I encourage you, if you like this conversation, every Tuesday going forward, starting at noon Eastern, we're going to have a forum like this at X Spaces uh, with similar conversations, not just talking about Bitcoin, but also more broadly digital assets, uh, you know, real tokenization of real world assets and such. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, Lynn, thanks again for your time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, lawyer, for, as always, for your helpful comments. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for tuning in, and hopefully we'll see you next week.